for those of you that i haven't met my name is karen kiefer and i'm the associate director here at the church in the twenty first century center and on behalf of the c twenty one center and some of our co sponsors which would be the women's resource center and the women's council at boston college and also the women's group at um, the School of Theology and Ministry. We uh, extend a warm welcome um, to, for this evening and for kind of an exciting event um, in women's voices to talk about conscience. Um, I have to tell you that it's a really exciting night for us. Uh, I was saying to Kristen earlier, seven months in the making, um, because tonight we celebrate um, not only this conversation, um, but we celebrate hot off the press the fall C21 resources guest edited by Kristen Heyer on Conscience at Work. Um, and we also celebrate the revival of our women's series, and it's called Women's Voices. And we started this series back in 2004, and um, we continued the series. Um, and then a couple of years ago, it almost, I, I don't like to say it fell by the wayside, but it just kind of fell off our programming. And uh, Tom Groom was, was really important in, in getting the revival of our Women's uh, Voices series back on track. Um, seven months ago, we approached Kristen Heyer and said, we'd like to do a magazine on conscience, and you're the one. And we had lunch, and um, we knew that this was her, her interest and her discipline, and she said yes, and it has just been an incredible honor for me to work with Kristen on this magazine and with Tom, um, and hopefully to put together a collection that will be that catalyst and, and resource for conversation. Um, back during that time, I think it was like the next day, we had lunch, with Katie Dalton from the Women's Resource Center, Diane Carey, uh, who heads up the Women's Council here um, at BC, uh, also Barbara Quinn um, from STM, and uh, Tom and myself, and we had a conversation about what would reviving this women's series look like. And so after um, a lot of talk and a lot of ideas, um, it just seemed like there was this perfect marriage happening where the magazine on conscience was on this track and then reviving the women's series was on this track and we thought aha let's put together an event that launches the magazine and also focuses on conscience on forming conscience and raising consciousness and then we thought okay who's our all-star lineup <laughs> well we talked to Kristen, and then we thought hmm kathy caveney Regine Jean-Charles, Jean I don't speak French, but I love saying that, um, and Carrie Cronin. What are the chances that we could get these four women together and have this conversation? And then what are the chances that we could do it on October 11th? <laughs> so I look at this night as grace-filled because everything happened and it all led up to this evening. Um, so. I am so excited uh, to be part of this conversation, and um, I, I want to say that, first of all, I'm going to hand um, the program over to Kristen. She's going to talk a little bit about the vision of the magazine, which you have in front of you. If you don't have a magazine, there are, are many on the tables. Um, she's also going to speak about conscience through her lens, and then she, in turn, um, will invite the other panelists into the conversation. They'll all speak for about five to seven minutes. And then you'll have a conversation amongst yourselves. And then we're gonna ask you to have a conversation with your neighbor for two or three minutes. And then we're all gonna talk. It's gonna be great. So anyway, I'm gonna stop talking so that you guys can start <laughs> talking. Also, note the biographies here of the panelists. This could be like 40 pages, but it's just um, a, sh a short paragraph. So anyway, we welcome Regine, Kathy, Carrie, and Kristen. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Karen. Is this on? Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Tom Groom and Karen Keeper for the invitation to guest edit this issue. It really gave me 
a welcome opportunity to delve more deeply into the meaning of conscience in the Catholic tradition. Um, I'd also like to thank, now I'm definitely mic'd, uh, I'd also like to loudly thank Stephanie Edwards, who's here tonight, for her collaboration through the selection and the editing processes, um, and also really for all our valuable conversations about conscience and moral agency. Um, I'd say my own interests in conscience uh, have been shaped by a convergence of several factors. On the one hand, we have the deluge of really complex issues that prick our conscience. Um, some of these relate to broad policy challenges. We can think of gun violence, uh, the refugee crises, or climate change. Um, but others are more cultural challenges that affect our public life. Um, profound threats to civil discourse, a throwaway culture, um, or tempting apathy and denial, retreating to what Pope Francis likes to call soap bubbles of indifference. Um, and then we wrestle more personally, perhaps, with challenges that we face in our work and our family lives. Um, he's not here, but I see the camera's rolling, so spoiler alert, my son turns 11 this week and he's not getting the iPhone that he feels that he desperately deserves <laughs> and really truly needs. Um, and this isn't the first time that his desires or peer pressure have clashed with our family's values, and I'm pretty sure it's not going to be the last. Um, <laughs> he's 11. <laughs> he's 11. He's got a long road. Kathy, don't tell him. Kathy knows Owen. Um, so one might conclude that in a selfie-obsessed culture uh, or amid dangerous, even crude headlines, it's best to simply retreat and protect the next generation um, on a model of family as safe haven from the harsh outside world. Um, and yet I really think that conscience formation can't happen in a vacuum or removed from reality. Um, a photo of Colin Kaepernick on the cover of Time magazine uh, in our pediatrician's office last week offered an entree into an honest conversation about racial justice and patriotism and conscience um, with the phone-deprived son. Um, but beyond parenting, it may be equally tough, I think, to ask whether we ourselves are settling uh, in different aspects of our lives. I think sometimes it's easier maybe just to condemn other people uh, or coast along, um, pushing aside, searching thoughts about whom we're really called to become. So recognizing and responding to these personal and shared challenges fall to conscience. Uh, and yet, I think conscience, um, our contemporary appeals to conscience, often function more as conversation stoppers, uh, which really block our thoughtful engagement. Um, Truncated notions of conscience can serve more as litmus tests for belonging or carte blanche to dissent um, rather than invitations to grow. So I think in this magazine, retrieving the depths of the Catholic moral tradition can help us recover a more robust notion of conscience in terms of our ability to perceive and pursue the good. Um, for conscience isn't just about being passively obedient, um, but rather proactive, discerning, and creative in response to life's challenges and God's invitation. So this issue tries to bring together ancient resources about the role of conscience together with some of its contemporary relevance for our lives and wider world. Um, so during the first meeting that Karen just mentioned that we talked about this um, issue, I, I mentioned I happened to be teaching to my freshmen and sophomores about conscience. And Karen remembered learning as a child that conscience was like a muscle, like a moral muscle. And I was really excited because that is not how my students typically think of it. But that was exactly one of the images I was trying to introduce to correct, um, maybe incorrect visions of conscience that sometimes, um, in that case, my young students had. Um, if they don't conflate conscience with personal preference, sometimes uh, I often find students think about conscience like a little mini angel or devil on your shoulder, um, or an infallible moral code hardwired into our brains. May they disagree with it. Is it post-adolescence? Is it right when you get to college? They're not sure, but it's automatic. Um, and so I think, uh, on the contrary, most of us struggle to form uh, and develop and inform our conscience so that we can better judge the right thing to do in pretty complex, complex circumstances. And it's the dynamic shape of conscience that we develop like a muscle uh, through its use. The growth isn't automatic. Uh, it can stagnate or decline, uh, just like we lose muscle tone and strength without exercise. And rather than this separate little voice whispering convenient moral directions, uh, it's an aspect of who we are as we attend uh, to the call of God to discover and to do what is right. 
So for instance, in the Hebrew and Christian scriptures, we find conscience described as our hearts, described as who we are in the inner sanctum of our being. So this issue highlights the ways in which the Catholic tradition understands conscience to be sacred, but frail and social. As Thomas Aquinas emphasizes, obeying our conscience is the very dignity of the human person, right? To go against your conscience is to sin. Uh, and yet, while it remains sacred, conscience can be wrong. It can be ill-informed. It can lead to harm. Uh, and so in its frailty, it needs to be developed and monitored. And whereas it's the site of the transcendent encounter, where we're alone with God, the very meaning of, of the word, conscientia, knowing together, uh, reminds us that our discernment must take place in community, right? Our relationships to one another and to God are essential to this exercise of conscience. And, and really our convictions of conscience are shaped uh, in and by the communities that influence us. So conscience helps determine the loves and the loyalties that influence our everyday decisions in the pursuit of the true and good. We're gonna hear a little bit more about that as the evening continues, how this is a lifelong process. Um, something else I want to mention about the issue is the influence of Pope Francis. He's drawn renewed attention to the importance of conscience, um, and so several of the e essays here highlight his contribution and really his summons. The Pope has insisted that Jesus wants neither selfish Christians who only follow their ego, nor what he calls remote-controlled Christians who are not free. He reminds us that responsible freedom is created in dialogue with God in our own conscience, um, you may have noticed in his recent Amoris Laetitia, he stresses the church's role in forming consciences for Christian freedom rather than replacing them, inviting church leaders to make room for the consciences of the faithful. He says they're capable of carrying out discernment in complex circumstances. So I think it's important that Pope Francis has noted the sacred ways in which a life lived according to conscience shapes our freedom and strengthens our ability to truly hear and respond to God's call. Our panel's title tonight, Coupling uh, Conscience Formation with Raising Consciousness, signals what, in my view, uh, is his most valuable contribution to this topic. The Pope has repeatedly attuned the world's focus to harmful attitudes that can distort the demands of conscience. Whether on the island of Lampedusa or in Laudato Si, he has underscored the pervasive worldviews that can inhibit moral growth, calling for our conversion from these mindsets. He emphasizes the ways in which social sin inhibits moral formation, um, really limiting our ability to choose authentic values over the ones that prevail in society. The culture of encounter that Kathy Caveney's essay in the volume um, lifts up also remains critical for conscientious discernment. For Pope Francis's concern that a church closed in on itself fails to answer the gospel call to reach out to the margins, um, links raising consciousness to forming conscience. His focus urges us to awaken to influences that constrain our exercise of conscience. Because I think one of its key tasks is not just to stand up to dehumanizing discrimination, for example, um, but also to become ever more aware of how our dominant culture can muffle the call of conscience. So to that end, this issue um, includes a, a section on racism in particular, you might say America's original sin, to highlight one important example of how unconscious bias and cultural sin often work against our efforts to discover and do the right thing. So in response to his warnings against such forces that can master our conscience, whether these forms of bias or the lure of consumerism, envy, relativism, doctrinal rigidity, Pope Francis counsels us to ask for the grace of discernment and watchfulness, reflecting back on our day regularly to get in touch with what happened in our hearts in light of everything that we faced. So we have a removable Ignatian examine in the issue uh, for your own use uh, in that vein. And finally, as the issue went to press, we learned of the death of Sister Ann Patrick, who's really a, a pioneering theologian in this arena. So we're honored to include here an excerpt from her final essay on creative responsibility, which reminds us that God offers tender mercy when we take risks um, or inevitably fall short. So 
Now switching gears briefly, in light of tonight's uh, co-sponsors and as this Women's Voices event, I've been reflecting on conscience formation in light of women's experiences in particular, diverse though they may be. Uh, and without detracting from many heroines of conscience in our traditions, I would just like to raise two brief concerns before turning it over. Um, first, the socialization of women to satisfy the demands of superego rather than pursue the call of conscience. So as Jim Keenan's essay in this issue outlines, the superego is that voice left over from early childhood years that continues to assert itself throughout <laughs> our lives. Childhood instructions intended to keep us safe uh, through voices of authority subsequently form this voice of superego, right? Don't do that, wash your hands. <laughs> um, but for girls, I might, would add, these internalized instructions frequently include, don't interrupt, be nice. Uh, and indirectly through our, some classroom experiences, we heard, let him go first. <laughs> So according to Keenan, this internalized supervising voice still lives in us as we age, and we often still perceive it as more powerful and more authoritative than we are. So unlike the superego, which um, warns us to stay where we are, conscience, again, is this invitation to grow. So I would venture to suggest that many women and girls are particularly at risk for prioritizing the voice of superego to that of conscience. We may be more apt to heed the shaming voice, which is typically the superego, that threatens guilt and isolation rather than the call of conscience, whose invitation to growth may entail disrupting expectations or failing to comply or failing to please. So perhaps in supporting women in particular, we need to be vigilant about the superego's inhibition of conscience. Because when women are socialized to comply or obey or be superwoman, uh, they may not be invited into fearless integrity uh, and interior freedom, first and foremost. In her essay on feminism and the spiritual exercises, um, a few years ago, not here, uh, Julia Dowd has characterized this dilemma in terms of helping women lean into God, uh, to, to play off Sheryl Sandberg. Second, Unlike the function of unconscious, uh, not unlike the function of unconscious racism in this volume, I worry that transnational cultures of sexism threaten to muffle the call of conscience and blind men and women to their complicity in gender injustice. Um, some of my academic work involves collaboration with ethicists around the globe, and whereas there are significant differences in gender uh, relationships and dynamics across culture, I'm repeatedly struck at our international conferences by panelists' attention to internalized attitudes that facilitate harm or violence against women. Reflecting assumptions about the ideal woman or patriarchal anxieties about evolving notions of femininity, these biases constrain freedom and threaten dignity. So colleagues in Bogota and Bangalore and Berlin alike have identified harmful effects of internalized gender expectations, um, in each case normalized by culture um, and perpetuated by legal and social norms. As Sister Vimala Changanamatam put it, fixed frameworks regarding women are the problem at the root of much of the violence against women in India, but also um, assumptions about her own teaching authority. So these voices have impacted my reflections on certain gender dynamics here in the US context. Practices and attitudes that perpetuate cultures of shame, fear, and violence. So I think raising consciousness about the pernicious effects of sexism remains essential to um, rightly forming conscience, especially in concert with our commitments to the full and equal dignity of women created in God's image and likeness. So closer to home, we might think of female college students reporting lower self-esteem as they move through the university system. We might think of confidence gaps in the workplace and missing voices in certain disciplines, um, or rhetoric diminishing the reach and threat of rape culture. So to close, I promise, I hope we can invite and empower one another to discern the call of conscience and boldly pursue responsible freedom, following uh, Jesus' risk-laden example uh, and that of Mary Magdalene from your poster tonight, The Apostle to the Apostles. So I would now like to invite reflections from my co-panelists, beginning with uh, Régine Jean-Charles. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Kristen, for that reflection. And thank you um, for the invitation to be here. I'm really glad to be here. Um, so as I think about uh, the place where forming conscience and raising consciousness intersect, I recall one of my favorite biblical verses, which is from the book of Hebrews. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who are mistreated or suffering as if you yourselves were suffering. I love this verse because it really, for me, you could say it was my own personal invitation to grow um, with regards to, um, to conscience and consciousness. And because it really makes explicit the link between having an empathetic heart and developing a heart for justice. I think that how we approach justice is so deeply related to these topics for today of forming conscience and raising consciousness. And I say this because um, for me, the expression raising consciousness immediately evokes the history of the civil rights and feminist movements, which used consciousness raising sessions as a tool to increase awareness from a personal point of departure in the 1960s and 70s. Movements for justice, equality, and freedom have always privileged experiential knowledge and an, as an important part of consciousness raising. Um, an important part of that was using people's, oppressed people's combined experience in order to understand how we are oppressed and who is doing the oppressing. Women have always been integral to building these kinds of movements, right? Um, we can think about, for example, in these consciousness raising sessions during the 70s about how feminists they got together and literally would, would share their stories of what they experienced, whether it was in their households or where, where, when they were at work, um, for how, you know, like you said, the pernicious forces of sexism were influencing their lives. I think also um, that we really have to reflect on knowledge and self-knowledge as integral parts of movement making, right? So this, again, civil rights, um, the feminist movement, but also today in Black Lives Matter, in the Black Lives Matter movement. I think that pairing knowledge with self-knowledge is an important um, part of everything that we do. So when you take something like the Black Lives Matter syllabus, which was an effort put together by a number of scholars in response to the movement, um, what they were trying to do is really help to contextualize and frame this current moment within a history of a larger movement for, um, against racial injustice in this country. Uh, in the 1970s, feminists would always say that consciousness raising was not supposed to be therapy. Um, that it is a, a, it is a program, it's the only program by which we can ensure that our liberation is based on the concrete reality of our lives. So again, you know, I talk to my students a lot about experiential knowledge, right? And how you can privilege your experience and talk about your experience, but let's not preclude that from actually doing the work, right? From actually <laughs> analyzing the text or building the movement or what have you. <laughs> um, I also think that on college campuses today, there's a lot of resonance with the effort to share your story, or we could call it your testimony, um, for how students have participated in these movements. So for example, a couple of weeks ago, we had the Solidarity March on this camp campus, and there were students who shared their personal testimonies with racism, sexism, ableism and homophobia on this campus. And I think that moments like that are important parts of truth telling um, that help to raise consciousness of those around them. With regards to women's voices, I just want to say again also that I think that um, women have had a long history, long been at the forefront of racial injustice movements. And I teach a course on black feminism now. And one thing that I always remind my students is that black women have always been involved in the feminist movement as well, which I think we sometimes forget. Um, from civil rights activists like Fannie Lou Hamer, or Ella Baker, um, to the founders of the Black Lives Movement today, Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Tometi, women have really taken seriously their role of linking conscience, consciousness, and justice. Uh, the second part of what I have to share is more kind of, I guess, my professional concerns and how this relates to my own uh, trajectory as a scholar. Uh, I think that consciousness raising for me is an integral part of my calling as a teacher and as a scholar. For me, this work has taken on many forms, whether it's addressing rape culture, um, standing in solidarity with student movements for racial just, against racial injustice, or just speaking difficult truths in the classroom. I think that those moments can always make us uncomfortable, and there's a, a larger debate that's happening now, right, about trigger warnings, which maybe that'll come up later, but um, I think that, you know, that, that that's part of the work, right, is that discomfort um, is going to prompt that growth. 
my first book, Conflict Bodies, The Politics of Rape Representation in the Francophone Imaginary, was in many ways born out of my own experience working with survivors of sexual violence in multiple contexts. So again, how I was able to um, suffer with those who were suffering as though I myself was suffering is a large part of why I, I, I started to do this kind of work. Um, and also another part of the development of my own conscious and my commitment to raising consciousness has been through my work with A Long Walk Home, which is a nonprofit whose mission is to educate, inspire, and mobilize people to end violence against women and girls. Um, as a part of A Long Walk Home, I've traveled to universities across the country to participate in performances and conduct workshops on sexual violence. We were able to, through the Women's Center, bring it to BC last year. Um, and we also have a girls program and in the girls program, we uh, train young women to become youth leaders and advocates in their community, especially in urban communities. We've been working in, on the west side of Chicago for years. And training them to understand, first of all, to do this work in their communities, right? So they're literally, they're the ones raising consciousness in these, you know, having circles, um, marches, using the arts to do that, but also using a model of what we call survivor leadership. And I think that the use of the arts in this is also really important. Um, as we think about what are the different parts of ourselves or the ways that we experience the world that we can mobilize in order to do this work. Uh, for me, participating in this transformative work has really shaped who I am as a scholar and an educator and a member of this community. And um, it also, also brings to mind for me a quote from Audre Lorde who says, quote, but the question is a matter of the survival and the teaching. That's what our work comes down to. No matter where we key into it, it's the same work, just different pieces of ourselves doing it. And the last part of what I'll share is about um, just as a parent forming conscience at home. And I'm the parent, the mother of, a son, of two sons and two daughters. Uh, and I do see myself as a consciousness raiser in my household. Um, I was telling my friends the other day about, you know, my, it, was, it was on Monday, I told my children, okay, it's Indigenous Peoples Day. And they're like, mommy, it's Columbus Day. No, it's Indigenous Peoples Day. <laughs> you know, here, let's watch a video on YouTube about why mommy calls it this, but not that. Um, and so I, I'm constantly, you know, one thing that we've been struggling with now too is, I don't know how many people are aware, but Derek Rose, um, a well-known basketball player, um, has been accused of, of rape. And so my boys love Derrick Rose. And, you know, I've been struggling. And so I was actually reading an article in the New York Times about Derrick Rose, and then one of them looked over my shoulder. And he said, what happened with Derrick Rose? And so now I have to explain this to him. And um, it was really, it was an important po moment for me because this work uh, on anti-violence work is such a big part of my life. Um, and I really do take seriously the importance of teaching children about rape culture from a young age. But it was the first time that I'd actually confronted it and had to do something about it. Uh, so it was, it was a teaching moment. And I think that you know, my, my husband and I often talk about the fact that um, with children, more is caught than is taught, right? So it might be, it's actually more difficult for me as a parent than it is for me as an educator or as a public speaker or as an activist, right? Because I usually have, you know, my notes in front of me. Whereas with the children, everything you say, everything you do, you know, is being, is being watched and evaluated. Um, and so, I, you know, to be honest, I, I can say that this is really an area of struggle for me, you know, and I really, I really struggle with how do I teach my children um, to, to develop that sense, a sense of, of um, what was it that you called it again? I love the way that you put it, I jotted it down here. You said moral agency, right? Is that what you said? Yes, moral agency. How do I encourage my children to develop a sense of moral agency? How do I um, understand, first of all, that they don't belong to me, but they belong to God, and that my job is to shepherd them, right? And as much as I want to shape them, uh, how do I kind of allow the, the Holy Spirit to be activated in them so that they can learn that themselves? They're, you know, I haven't gotten the cuss right. for an iPhone yet, but <laughs> um, my boys are nine and seven and a half right now, but it's, you know, a constant struggle. It's and then coming. the other thing I think about as a mother of, you know, so this also speaks to what you were saying before about conscious formation, not ha conscious formation not happening in a vacuum, because um, as my children get older, I have to put to thought how much I expose them, right, to injustice, to cruelty, to violence. We watch the debate with them. Not the last debate, That's but the right. one before, yes. And they wanted to know if they were going to watch the most recent one, and I said, no, you know, we just let them watch the beginning because they have to go to bed. But um, even the next day, I listened to NPR almost every morning with them, and I had to, you know, I, I, could, I felt like I couldn't 
put it on because I didn't want to necessarily have these conversations with them at the time. But um, at the same time, I really do believe that going back to what I said about cultivating an empathetic heart, part of that is being tuned into injustice, right? Part, part of that is being exposed. I can remember moments from my own childhood, whether it was growing up in a predominantly white suburb just next door <laughs> um, and experiencing racism, right? At five years old, having a, a child in my ballet class um, say something really racist to me or understanding when I traveled to Haiti that the reason why my grandmother only spoke Creole and her brother spoke French it was because she was a girl and she wasn't allowed to go to school. So I recall those moments in my own formation mm -hmm. um, as part of what gave me this heart for, for justice that I have. So questioning myself about, you know, when do I start to really expose to them, them to that? Um, and of course, you know, as the mother of black male children also, when I think about the realities of police brutality, racial pro profiling, incarceration rates in this country, the proliferation of rape culture again everywhere from videos to presidential elections the question for me is you know how do i again how, how do i engage them on this right and how do i you know I, I think i so desperately want them to grow up to people to grow up to be people of conscience um but in reality i don't i really don't have any formula for the best way to do this um and the best way to make them sensitive to that so i think for me a lot of it just comes down to really continuously praying for them and um, really trusting God, right, for their path and trusting that they were given to us for a reason, so, uh, or we, they were brought here through us for a reason, <laughs> even though they don't belong to us. But, um, and you know, just trusting also my own agency and my husband's agency, uh, our moral agency, and the decisions we make as parents. That's all I have Thank you so much, Tracy. Kathy? Oh, great. Well, thank you both for your comments. It's, it's, it's wonderful to be on panels like this because you, you get to learn um, as much as more than you um, contribute. Um, what I would like to do really is maybe try to pick up a couple of mm -hmm. threads from both of your talks. Um, uh, Kristen talked very much about uh, conscience within the context of the Catholic tradition as being a very vital part of our anthropology and our spirituality and our moral theology. And you talked about it, Regine, as, as, as not just you know, focused within any particular religious tradition, but being rooted there and, and moving out to do justice in the broader world. And what I hope to do in my few uh, minutes here is, is maybe suggest that there are resources in the secular world for thinking about conscience that may be helpful as dialogue partners. Mm -hmm. They're not uh, perfect, but, but they're, also, they're a place to start a conversation. Um, I teach not only in the theology department, but also in the law school. And what I'd like to suggest is that um, there are resources within secular law for actually thinking about conscience. Now, you all know about the, you know, the conscientious objectors in, in the war, and, um, and, 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 and you've heard about you know, the conscience and the religious liberty uh, kind of questions, and, and they're there, and they're, they're, they're part of a kind of a much more um, adamant oppositional uh, to, to, uh, context to the to the broader policies of the nation, and, and they're important. But I also think there are resources in the more homely and humble aspects of the law, <laughs> such as the <laughs> aspect that I teach, which is contract law. Um, there is a doctrine in contract law which stops a contract from being enforced called unconscionability. Mm. Unconscionability. And it is a contract is unconscionable is one which is such that no person in his or her senses and not under delusion would make, on the one hand, nor any honest or fair person um, would accept, on the other. So th there's an underlying moral sense about what unconscionability means. Um, uh, that this is something that nobody should get involved in um, if they're of good heart and of good mind. I want to talk about the leading case uh, dealing with unconscionability because I think it suggests a couple of things about conscience that we can draw a broader lesson from. 
One is that conscience is dynamic. You don't just look at a question once, you come back and you look at a question again and again, and you see different things. Second, conscience is about learning um, from your past mistakes, including your past mm. exercises of conscience. And so the case I'm going to talk about um, that, that helps us see this is a case called Williams versus Walker Thomas Furniture. And it has to do with a furniture store, really more like a rent-a-center, um, Walker Thomas Furniture, that operated um, in, uh, in a neighborhood in Washington, D.C., you know, for in, in the mid-1960s, uh, serving largely African-American and largely uh, people with very limited financial means. Um, and a woman named Aura Lee Williams from 1957 to 1962 uh, bought a lot of things from Walker Thomas Furniture. She spent $1,800 buying household goods um, from them. Um, and in 18, but in April 1962, she paid her balance down to $164, which is pretty good. But then she made a decisive move. Mrs. Williams walked into Walker Thomas and bought herself a stereo system for $514.95. You think, okay, she's bought a stereo, she's bought a lot of things before. We don't know what happened to her, but in the fall of 1962, so about six months later, she defaulted on the payments on the stereo. And then what Walker Thomas did is what caused all the problems. There was a provision in the contract that said, quote, all payments shall be credited pro rata on all outstanding uh, leases, bills, and accounts due. You're thinking, what does that mean? Well, what that means is that the debt secured for every new purchase um, is secured by every other purchase that you've made that you've not fully paid off. So basically, the store has a security interest in absolutely everything that you've ever bought from them. And so Williams, uh, uh, Mrs. Williams had to endure Walker Thomas Furniture coming back into her house and collecting not just the stereo system, but also a bed, some sheets, the washing machine that she'd bought before and nearly paid off. Um, they made the Grinch look kindly. <laughs> <laughs> the only way out is to secure, is to pay off one thing completely before buying something else. That's the only way you can get out of this conundrum. So was this provision unconscionable? Did it shock the conscience? In addressing this question, the D.C. Appellate Court um, looked at both procedural questions, was the, was the provision in fine print, uh, was there a disparity in bargaining power, uh, uh, how did they go about doing this? As it turned out, Walker Thomas Furniture filled in the contracts themselves after they dropped the good off. So you could say that, you know, there wasn't just fine print, there was almost no print. Um, it's hard to see nothing. Um, <laughs> And th then secondly, um, was there a substantive problem in the, uh, in the contract? Was it reasonable or uh, fair? And uh, the, the court said, we really don't think so. This kind of repossession uh, provision, it's one thing to take back the stereo. It's another thing to go back six years and take back everything that she's ever bought from them. Um, th that's a problem. And it, but it quoted, so it said, yes, you know, the contract is, is, is unconscionable. But in the, in the opinion, it quoted a, 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 a passage from the lower court that I want to use to show how conscience moves beyond itself. It says about Mrs. Um, uh, 
Mrs. Williams' contract. The reverse, and I'm quoting, the reverse side of the stereo contract listed the names of the appellant social worker and her $218 monthly stipend from the government. Nonetheless, with full knowledge that appellant had to feed, clothe, and support both herself and her seven children on this amount, appellee sold her a $514 stereo. So the court thought the problem was that, mm -hmm. you know, the, the store shouldn't be selling this woman coded for race, coded for gender, coded for poverty, the stereo. So the first exercise of conscience was saying this contract is wrong. The second exercise of contract came later when scholars of critical race theory, of feminist theory, went back and said, yeah, it's wrong. But your articulation about why it's wrong needs a lot to be desired. <laughs> You're missing the forest for the trees here. The problem is, is much broader than that. So we have a dynamic uh, you know, kind of push toward broader considerations, not just of the narrow contract of Mrs. Of, of Mrs. Williams, but of the broader context of how we think about finances and how we think about um, you know, debt load and how we think about the operation of our capitalist system in a context where we're still thoroughly coded on, ge on, uh, on gender and on race and on poverty. There's no easy solution to this, right? Um, some of the more conservative economic mm. analysis of law professors say, well, yeah, but if you start making them uh, you know, charge lower prices and that, they're going to leave the market entirely. And then what are we going to do for the people who don't have cars and don't have um, access to you know, easy cash or to um, you know, capacious credit card accounts? How are we going to help them? It's a problem we still face to this day. Um, so conscience doesn't just recognize problems. It also has to come up with creative and sometimes only the best you can do solutions uh, to, um, to, to fix it. So right now, that was 1963, you know, the case was decided, I think, 64. Um, Rent to own contracts are still a big problem. Uh, a case a couple of years ago said that if you wanted to um, use a rent to own TV um, from like a rent a center, uh, 90 days same as cash for a LG 60 inch television, you'd have to pay $2,800 and change. Uh. Um, if you paid on the extended plan, you'd pay $4,678 for the same television set. If you bought it off of Amazon just right away, you'd pay $1,300, less than half. So even if you borrowed on a regular credit card, you'd only pay $1,747. Uh, $1, so how do we deal with this situation? Conscience not only says it's wrong, we've got a problem here, but has to come up with something creative at least to minimize the problem. Several states, um, including Vermont, are saying, well, at the very least, we can set a cap to how much they can charge for this. They're going to charge more, but it doesn't have to be quite so much more. They can still make a profit. And they really need to disclose both what it would cost to buy it right straight out and what it would cost to buy it on credit. Is it everything? No, but it is incremental improvement in a world where sometimes you know, we're not in the kingdom of God, we're only moving along the way as pilgrims, and the most we can do in the field hospital of the church and of the community is sometimes patch the wounds and keep coming up with better patches. So the point of this story really is to say, we don't need to see in the church the secular realm as this realm against which we, um, ex we protect our conscience, we wall ourselves off. We can also find resources for collaboration and critique by looking at the exercises of conscience in the secular world, not the hardcore 
culture war places maybe, but in the ordinary details of justice and injustice as we go about our daily lives. Thank you so much, Kathy. Mm -hmm. Kerry. It's hard to follow you <laughs> three. Um, I, I also want to say thank you to, uh, for being invited into this conversation. Um, Tom and Karen always run such great programs, and Katie Dalton is always such a great collaborator, and a, these three people are always such great personal supports for me, too, so I appreciate that. Um, it's such an honor to be here with such amazing scholar teachers, and um, I, uh, I'm just bringing up the rear. Um, I, and I, I especially loved the idea that you're, that you're offering us, um, and, and I hope I can say something that might also supplement it, uh, that, that the learning of conscience is, also, is not just an individual's job, but a society, the job of society. Mm -hmm. And that's, I, I think that's such a, a beautiful way of thinking about it. Um, and, and especially in our times, we have a lot to learn as a society, I think, in terms of conscience and the development of, of conscience and adequate consciousness about what, what we need to be thinking about. My, uh, my area of interest in this um, is, I'm interested in all of these things, but I guess my particular area is uh, thinking about college student development and moral uh, moral growth among college students and young adults, and how conscience is formed uh, in young people, especially in the context of college uh, and university education. So uh, this was the topic of my dissertation and, and just a little bit of writing that I've done. Uh, one of the things that I, I want to point out um, in terms of that, in terms of the moral development of college students is that sometimes we in universities wonder if that's, if, if thinking about the, the development of conscience among our students is our job. And of course the, the great uh, provocateur and uh, educator Stanley Fish says, absolutely not, no way, it's not our job. Uh, I don't wanna, and I don't wanna be held accountable for it <laughs> later <laughs> after they graduate. Um, and become terrible people. And, um, uh, but one of the things that, that I would like to note for our conversation tonight with everyone here is that research overwhelming in, in uh, developmental theory in education circles, research shows overwhelmingly that, that moral development in young people and young adults is, is one of the areas of the most dramatic change and growth during the college years, especially, particularly, um, among students who attend four-year, primarily residential colleges. Mm -hmm. And particularly, even further, particularly among first-year students. It's one of the, the exploding growth areas um, uh, among college students, especially college freshmen. And yet, the thing about the moral development of, of young adults is that, and this development of conscience, is that we don't actually know what precipitates it, <laughs> what, what sets the conditions for it, and, and really what things impact it. There's been a ton of research done uh, by people who are much better researchers than I, um, on, on all kinds of different factors that may, that may impact this and that, may, sort of, that we can look at and say, oh, aha, that's it. Maybe it's uh, the interactions of, of young people with their peers and, uh, fr who are from diverse, who have diverse attitudes or diverse backgrounds or, or that kind of thing. Maybe it's, maybe it's our fantastic classes. <laughs> well, probably not, but maybe it's the conversations they're having in their residence halls, maybe it's just the climate on campus, but what we do know about moral growth uh, of college students is that it, it isn't correlated to a wide array of demographics we might think are at the root of that, S especially things like cognitive ability or cognitive motivation, 
we would think that people who are sort of interested in expanding their horizons are the people whose horizons are going to be expanded and whose, whose moral conscience and moral consciousness might be impacted by college. But as a matter of fact, that, that doesn't seem to be <laughs> the case. It's, it's very strange. So on the one hand, we have a lack of information. We don't know what it is, but something's happening. And as, as a person who works at a university, I'm really fascinated by that. What's <laughs> happening around here? What, what's in the food and the drink? Well, you know, not the drink, but you know. Uh, no, probably I mean. the drink. <laughs> maybe, maybe. But then there's something that always surprises me when I talk to students. And I, I talk to students about lots of their own concerns about moral decision-making, sexual decision-making, relationship decision-making. And, and what I find is that students, especially first-year students, are constantly surprised when I remind them that they came to Boston College with a moral framework already. <laughs> they say, oh, no, no, I'm going to get one now that I'm here. I'm paying the big bucks for this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I say, no, no, it's, it's helpful for us to remind ourselves that we all come as, we all came as young people, and they're coming with moral frameworks. And I, and I think it's that, you know, with all due respect to Stanley Fish, I think if it's going to be happening, that their, moral, that their moral development is going to take place while they're here, and it's going to take place in, really in very dramatic ways, and we happen to be here <laughs> doing something called education that I, I think it does behoove us and them to get in on this and, and help them with it. And I think one of the things that I think our, job, our jobs include is to help them discover the moral philosophy they came with mm -hmm. because it is unknown to them <laughs> in sometimes shocking ways. And and then also to, to help them ask questions about the sufficiency of their moral frameworks, you know, to help them with the questions like, what am I doing when I'm making a moral judgment? What am I doing when I'm, when I'm uh, doing that dynamic thing that you pointed out, that, that conscience development is? What's happening to me? And what's happening with my discernment of feelings and my discernment of of ideas around more, you know, significant moral issues. And so, you know, I think it's, it's helpful if we help them to understand whether or not their moral frameworks and their moral questions are sufficient, not only to their own lives, but to all of our lives. Because often I find, and I, I, was, uh, I was telling Kristen, I'm so excited about this. Uh, I got an early, we got early copies of this. Um, <laughs> because we're so special. And uh, I, I was really excited to read Darlene, uh, I, I don't know how Weaver. to say Weaver, Darlene Weaver's piece, because she pointed, she, she's just got such a great way of sort of saying some, some really complex things in just really <laughs> uh, just pithy ways. And you know, one of the things that I encounter with students, especially first year students, is that, that their basic ways of formulating moral, uh, moral concerns or formulating their their moral approach to things or ethical approaches is balancing my interests against somebody else's in sort of a strangely capitalist sort of way or a, a voluntarist logic puzzle, like if I do this, then these things will happen or that sort of thing. But then, as Darlene Weaver points out, that it mostly boils down to uh, the moral formulation of I just have to be true to myself, yes. right? That if I'm just true to myself, then the moral thing will happen. Um, and that the only sin, there's no sin anymore except not being true to yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and, or being an authentic person, no, who knows what that is, you know? Um, and, and so I think to sort of challenge and support students on, on what their, what their moral frameworks are and the sufficiency of those various kinds of approaches to moral and ethical issues is, is part of our job. And I think that uh, learning, really modeling, learning both as individuals and as communities to learn conscience, right? I mean, I think on our campus, we have to 
show students how to learn conscience. And, and that means that you know, individuals have to do that, institutions have to do that, communities mm -hmm. and society, we all have to do that. We have to be actively practicing conscience. And so that led me to, to think about um, the Pope's model of theology, which as Kathy, and Kathy's article is beautifully um, articulates, Pope Francis's theology of encounter, which is at, this, at the base of his idea, I think, of that raising consciousness is about awakening conscience. conscience, really not just raising issues, that raising consciousness is not just simply raising more issues or more data about mm. more issues. It is literally waking up mm. our consciences mm. and sort of from the dogmatic slumber, you know, of, of, of either the superego or the, well, this is how my family does it, or yeah. this is how we do it in my community, to sort of wake us up. Mm -hmm. um, and to, I, I was reading over the, over the summer, I read uh, I, Austin Ivory's great biography of Pope Francis called The Great Reformer, which is a fantastic biography. And in it, Ivory points out that that Pope Francis's preference for, um, for choosing the concrete over the abstract and choosing particulars over, uh, particular over theory, or to choose, you know, that, that, that the, funda the fundamental orientation, I think this was a quote from one of the pieces too, that, that Pope Francis's claim is that the fundamental orientation of conscience is to God, not to the magisterium, to persons rather than theologies. You know, that we have to obviously do that work to, to set the stage and to set the conditions for thinking, thinking together on, mm -hmm. on these lines, but that, you know, I think back to the stories in this biography of Pope Francis's ways of forming seminarians when he was the, uh, the vocation director in Argentina for the Jesuits, um, and he had the seminarians go to the barrios and work in the barrios first before they studied theology, to always work with the people. And he would, as soon as, when they would come to him and say, I have to study, you know, I've got to read these things for class, he'd say, well, first go, because Mrs. So-and-so has a problem, go solve her problem and then study. Theology and that 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 his theology of encounter is that that we would always choose, you know, the concrete over the abstract, and that raising consciousness wakes is waking us up so that we can then come back and and really understand what conscience is calling forth from us, mm -hmm. and that it's about it's about work on the ground and mm -hmm. about growing growing my conscience and growing my consciousness of, of what, of how expansive the problems of our age are and what, what's being called forth, not just from the problems of our age, but from a person right in front of me. Um, that to me is, solves the problem of how do, how do we do this? It's, it's, the, it's the theology of encounter, I think, that gives us a great model in working with students um, who, who are, Again, as I, as I want to go back to my first point, a lot is happening with our <laughs> students morally and ethically and personally. And to get in on that conversation with them means to not only encounter them where they are, but to help them encounter people who need them to think more, more actively and more responsibly and reasonably and lovingly about the world. So I'll end it there. Thank you so much, Carrie. So I'm, I'm noticing, I'd like to open it up to widen the conversation. I'm noticing we were going to have crosstalk, but I'm noticing we've already done that. Right. I mean, you all have brought out the culture of encounter, the dynamic notion, the, necess the necessity of a heart for justice. I think Karen was going to invite participants now um, to conversation. 
yeah I, there's obviously so much to think about so much to talk about in a wonderful way so I invite you to talk to someone that's next to you or, or, or in the room just for a couple of minutes and then we're just going to come back and then open up the conversation a little broader like what are you thinking what you know what did we just hear it's big um, this is for mostly for Carrie and it's probably encouragement I enjoyed your talk I spend my life in secondary education and uh, you get them as they they come <laughs> along. And I think, well, just the fact that you're in a department named after Lonergan, uh, I'm going to say something <laughs> about that. But, you know, the, the, the children by their nature, you know, Rahner's theology, God's gift of honesty and clarity and everything is in their nature. Mm -hmm. It's in their families and it's with them as they come up. When they come to the secondary level, they meet a variety of students and they want to try out their, their basic feelings about life as it's going along. And you know the ascent of wonder, uh, wonder mm. being what oh, it yeah. is. You know, they, they see things and, and they see the goodness in it, but they also see the questions. Right. And so when they come to you, they now have a new set of questions and because you're in a larger setting and there's a pluralistic group, they're going to try out things on a larger scale. And likewise, when they leave Boston College, they're going to be in a world that challenges them again. And this goes back to the whole growth of conscience that, you know, it happens at every stage. It doesn't happen just once. So I, I don't know why, you know, when you're talking about all the, the research that's needed, uh, this is just sort of the way young people are. I mean, it's the way God made them, and uh, well, for what That's it's worth. Wonderful. That's wonderful. I think uh, that reminded me um, when I, uh, I was writing my dissertation, I was comparing um, moral development uh, scores of students with writing that they did, and uh, the this sort of... Uh, impulse to questions and the unrestricted desire to know that Lonergan talks about um, was, was so clearly there in the students who, who really sort of posted amazing uh, scores in moral growth through their first year at Boston College. In every case of those students, their student writing reflected a real openness and questions. Their essays that they wrote for class, not that weren't uh, they didn't know that those essays would be uh, sort of paired with their moral uh, test. <laughs> I, well, you know, that's a, that's a different kind. That's a moral question for me. Oh, but like, <laughs> we were looking at writing. I was looking at writing to see, well, what kinds of things did they write about that, for, you know, that I can say about students who had enormous, very dramatic sort of uh, changes in their moral growth. And their essays were full of questions. Their essays were packed mm. full of questions. Mm. And the students who, who didn't advance or even declined in their moral, uh, their moral test scores by the end of the year were students who, to a person, did not list one question in either their beginning of the year or end oh, of wow. the year essays. That so that wonder generates, generates not only great questions, but questions about about conscience and about what what I need, where I need to head, and an, an openness to to be to be included in the kind of learning that that we in communities are called to do. I think. Can I just piggyback? I think yeah. too with the different models of conscience or less hopeful models. Sometimes it's mistaken as having all the answers. I don't know right. about your students' papers, but right. you know, we all have students or we all study along students who kind of entered, right. I entered the doctoral program here with students who knew, you know, oh, and I yeah. thought, wow, you have nothing left to learn. <laughs> I was all intimidated. <laughs> and yet you're so right that conscience in this tradition especially is about um, committing to pursue those questions, right? right? Yes. A willingness to, to engage proactively right. in seeking the truth, not kind of case closed. Um, having all the answers. Yeah. That was a long time ago, not any doctoral students today. <laughs> uh, I'm old. <laughs> um, hi, so my name is JC and I, um, am, I'm in the theology department. And so what caught my attention about this forum was that somehow I 
I was framing my teaching philosophy with this phrase, the exact phrase that you guys used, um, forming consciousness, uh, forming consciences and raising consciousness. And so I was glad to hear the way that, ways that you guys were connecting that. But as an upcoming educator and one who hopes to uh, touch upon these topics that, are, that make people uncomfortable, um, how do you, you would mentioned trigger warnings, how do you navigate those? And especially what is sort of that, com being um, aware of that conversation, but um, being able to um, work around it, work with it, such that you can still form consciences, uh, consciences without um, uh, avoiding hard topics? Mm -hmm. That's a great question, thank you. So um, for me, you know, a lot of it is dictated by the content of my syllabus period, right? Mm -hmm. So I teach, um, I teach in Romance Languages and Literatures and African and African Diaspora Studies. So all of the texts that I teach are f from the African diaspora, right? My research is on sexual violence, so I, I, I teach a lot of books that have, you know, thematic content related to sexual violence. Um, I teach texts about the Rwandan genocide. I teach um, mm -hmm. about, you know, I teach a class on black feminism for which we read writers from African-American authors like Toni Morrison, but also Edwidge Donsiket, who's a Haitian-American author. I teach a lot of Edwidge Donsiket. So some of it, the texts themselves yield these questions, right? Uh, I think that, you know, one of the things that I always um, tell the students that we're trying to practice is, again, thinking about form and content in relationship to each other. And this is, again, as a literary scholar, something that I have to do, right? I have to teach them about the, the context, but also about the text. So part of my work is done for me when I select those books, right? And I do that on purpose. Um, and so I do have the luxury, especially now, you know, after tenure, I have the luxury of being able to teach whatever <laughs> I want, <laughs> um, which is great. But I also think that, you know, with regards to, you know, because I, I have worked with so many survivors and so many, um, and I do teach a lot of books. I mean, I've thought very deeply about um, sexual violence in the world and uh, in, in the represent and in the symbolic world. I um, actually do do a form of trigger warnings, but it, which is more like survivor acknowledgement, right? So mm -hmm. it's not an out, and this is what makes me uncomfortable about the, about the whole trigger debate. I think it's actually being framed um, in a way that it's just it's just um, being talked about as an out. If something is uncomfortable and I don't want to discuss it or it's difficult for me, then just give me an out, right? And that's how they're, they're framing it. I think that there's a way that you can say, you know, when you do survivor acknowledgement, when I say, hey, one, one in five women has been sexually assaulted in her lifetime, so likely there are people in this class whom this has affected, maybe themselves, maybe a loved one, maybe a friend, and I think it's important that we acknowledge that up front, right? So the acknowledgement, and even sometimes saying, hey, this is difficult. I recall, I see one of my, my graduate students here. I remember last year, I was teaching a class called Paris Noir, Black Par the Literature and Culture of Black Paris. And we had some very difficult conversations about you know, race and privilege. And um, at one point, a, the, the students made a presentation about a comic in France who's really known for making anti-Semitic comments mm. um, relentlessly. And this was also after the, the, the Charlie Hebdo um, killings, right? And so. We had to confront those issues in class. And um, I think that there were definitely times where the students, I, I see a difference in my students in French and my students in African and African diaspora studies. Mm -hmm. Many of the AADS students have been thinking about this, right? It's a, a self-selected group versus people who, you know, they just want to learn about French, you know, Francophone literature. They didn't come to necessarily <laughs> talk about like racism and sexism, but I don't really give them a choice. Um, and, so, and I find that, you know, because it's born from the text and, you know, I, and, and me, you know, maybe for me also being black and female, right, and of Haitian descent um, also kind of enables me to, to navigate these conversations in a different way. I think that this, I've always, the students have, I've generated a lot of feedback from the students that they appreciate it and that they feel that it's necessary and they don't think they would have had this conversation otherwise. I don't know that I gave you an answer, but lots of comments. <laughs> Put Toni Morrison on your syllabus. <laughs> <laughs> The, um, I think the phrase, the, the, one of the things that clarified for me this evening was the phrase that Regine picked up from, <coughs> from uh, Kristen about moral agency. And I think in many ways Kathy and, and Kerry's presentations reflected this, the reclaiming of our moral agency, now, not to stereotype my Catholic background, but in many ways Catholics of my vintage grew up not with moral agency, but with moral dependency. 
In other words, depending on the church to tell us what was right and what was wrong. And we basically accepted that. Whereas in, in some ways that was very unfair and certainly a misrepresentation of the richer and longer and larger and older Catholic tradition, which has championed a teaching church, but also freedom of conscience and the agency of the person. So in a sense, the great blessing uh, to give Pope Francis more credit than, than even beyond what, what Kerry said, um, one of the great blessings is that he has brought us back to this richer tradition where he, in Amoris Laetitia, where he says, of course we have a teaching church and we have a certain understanding of marriage, for example, as the ideal and blah, blah, blah. But meanwhile, there'll be circumstances and situations where people can use their conscience and where very often they'll come up with decisions that may be contrary to what the church would typically expect. And that is perfectly moral for people to do that. In fact, they're entitled and in some ways even bound to do it and to follow their, their own conscience. But that's almost like, because that healthy tension between a teaching church and freedom of conscience, in large part, the tension had been collapsed, at least in my growing up years, and probably in some ways in the previous two pontificates before Francis, the, the tension was collapsed in favor of the teachings of the church. And in some ways, the task of our time now, and aided and abetted by good publications like this and, and Pope Francis helping us to reclaim it, the task of our time is the reclaiming of our moral agency, which indeed is informed by tradition and in conversation with the faith community and, and convert the, 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 the conscientia, as, as uh, uh, Kristen said, is, is to, to know together. And yet there's also this deep tradition of our own personal discernment, our own moral agency. So I think that's been one of the richest aspect of the conversation, at least for me this evening. So thank you. Hi, I just um, a comment on that. I think, though, it's more than just reclaiming it. I mean, uh, in the sense of, you know, we want it and, you know, the, the, you know, they didn't have it, you know, before Vatican II and then we've had these two popes. I mean, there's, there's, an, there's a, a significant number of people in the church who, who are afraid of, of, of an empowered notion of conscience, of an active notion of agency. They like, they would prefer to just, you know, download the catechism app in their head and, um, and just proceed on with the next set of questions. So part of what we need to do, I think, is actually not just we're claiming it against, we know it's important, and we're claiming it against the people that would deny it. It's also kindling a, a, a desire and, and a sense of importance of this in, in, in now almost two generations of people who, who think of the church as, as, as saying the only way to safety, the only way to engage the world is to hunker down and, 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 and imprint the, um, the rules as they interpret them on, um, on their psyches. So, how do you make people trust and love the God who created them with a conscience? And, and I think trust is important. If you don't trust God as a merciful and loving God, you're going to say, well, I'm going to have to take the safe way. I'm going to bury my talents. I'm going to, I'm going to do all of the homework and the extracurricular activity, and I'm not going to go out and take any risk with any life lessons that could possibly get me a bad God grade. Um, so that's, I think, part of the challenge. I think that's really right. Can I just piggyback on that? Um, we have, I think, three essays in the issue that pick up on this tension that Tom and Kathy are pointing to. I want to say David Dacas. Um, there's three essays in the magazine that pick up on this tension. <laughs> Between uh, maybe an ecclesialist understanding of conscience, the download app, and a more personalist conciliar notion of conscience. Darlene wants to talk about mm -hmm. it's not just kind of knowing the teaching, but it takes our affections and we look at moral exemplars and our experience and the data of our changing experience, right? And I think that's why the awakening piece that you emphasize, yeah. I think is also, I mean, you can't be an active moral agent if you're just kind of downshifting into this autonomous, um, whether in terms of culture or in terms of church teaching. But just one final note, Kathy and I were at a, a conference with Ann Patrick mm -hmm. on conscience and healthcare from which her essay is excerpted. And she was so concerned about this uh, that she said, I want us to talk about creativity. She, I mean, mm -hmm. I think she shared the concerns you're raising and said, she didn't say conscience has so much baggage, but she says we've had such a long tradition of understanding conscience in a quite different way. What if we talked about trusting the tender mercy of God and 
our role in, mm -hmm. in taking creative responsibility. Um, so anyway, just to echo what you're saying. She was, she was amazing. Yes. I was remembering just when you were talking about that of, uh, so uh, Karen and I uh, were part of a, interviewing a, a group of uh, 10 uh, females, juniors and seniors from Boston College for a, um, it was a focus group. We ran two focus groups with 10 men and 10 women for the next uh, C21 resource magazine that's on conscience formation among young adults. And so we, were, we had a fascinating conversation, uh, Karen and I, for two hours with this group of 10 women from Boston College. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the first things out of the box was we asked them what they thought conscience was. And somebody immediately said, uh, which made me feel not so old, uh, was, oh, I think of it like Jiminy Cricket. And I thought, oh, they've heard of Jiminy Cricket. That's great. Um, <laughs> Jiminy Cricket, and, and so I was, when I was reading your remarks and, and listening to you earlier, I love that, that distinction between the Jiminy Cricket model and the muscle, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, the conscience as a muscle distinction, you yeah. know, because it isn't, right, if the Jiminy Cricket is just a little pope, you know, or a little, a little bishop, uh, you know, up on my shoulder, then uh, just whispering the catechism in my ear, um, but it's rather a, a muscle, and, and if it's not just personal preference or just I gotta be me, you know, <laughs> sort of up there, uh, but rather myself as a as a as a a learning, a, you know, a person who has real agency in not only in my own choices but in the world, mm -hmm. you know, in in how things are gonna play out. And, and trust is so important. And it re oh shoot, it reminds me <laughs> that last week I went to the um, to the uh, discussion between Mary Madeline and Donna Brazil on mm. politics. Not to bring up politics, but here I go. Bonnie uh, and I were talking afterwards, and Donna Brazil asked, uh, who's the interim head of the DNC, asked the audience in Rob Sham Theater. There were f over 400 plus people, I think, attending most of whom were women, it was run by the Women's Council, and she said, who here is thinking about maybe someday running for office? And three people what? in the audience raised their hands, wow. and all of them were white men. <laughs> and it was startling. They couldn't see, I think they could see that there were three people who had raised hands, but I was sitting in the back, and I thought, oh my gosh, <laughs> how'd that just happen right there? And that to me is about trust too, that can I, you know, is this a trustworthy, welcoming horizon in which to sort of grow myself and my, my desires mm. and my passions? And I feel mm. like students, students I know don't, aren't, don't trust that. Mm. They don't trust that there's any agency to be found there. Yeah. And this, much this more election also. season probably isn't helping. Right. No. <laughs> Good Lord, no. So sorry, that was just, I just like. Unfortunately, we probably stayed around like But we have to head off. Um, but I, I just want to remind you of a couple of things. First of all, um, the magazine is online, um, so you can share it online. Also, we do send out magazines to parishes, to schools, People, they can join our, um, our C21 mailing list. We send this magazine out to 185,000 people each semester. So it's a tremendous service and investment for the university. So we, we definitely want to share it. Um, I also want to bring your attention to um, page 17, I believe it is. Uh, 19, actually. And it's our fall events page. And if you can take a look at the events page, you can see the upcoming events. We have another event this week on Thursday night, um, and we have Mary Gutierrez, and she is going to speak from Kara on where do we go from here, priestly ministry in the 21st century. Um, so anyway, stay tuned to that. Um, again, profound gratitude and thanks to all of you. Kristen, it, it's been a, just a pleasure kind of being on this journey. And uh, we look forward to continuing the conversation because, as most of you know, the whole mission behind the Church of the 21st Century Center is to be that catalyst for conversation. So keep talking, but we got to go. <laughs> Good night, and thanks for coming.